When's the last time you ever heard a message on hell? Now, a great number of ministers don't even believe in hell anymore. Dr. Savage, a theologian, said, I wouldn't care if hell were written on every page of the Bible, I still wouldn't believe it. Now, most Christians believe there's a hell, but they really don't like to think much about it. They get edgy when they hear preaching about it, in fact, because uh, it seems so far away from this life of ease and prosperity we have for us going in America. And even sinners like to think they're going to heaven. They don't even think about hell. And the only reason people can be comfortable in their sin, they remove the thought of hell completely out of their thinking. Shorty, a uh, drug addict about this high, came to me once and said, Mr. Wilson, I dreamed I died and went to heaven. God found out I was a junkie, so he sent me to junkie heaven. He said, and when I got there, he said, I was sitting on a mountain of beautiful white powder, as far a huge mountain of white heroin. And there were thousands of needles as far as your eye could see. And at the base of this mountain of heroin was an eternal lake of fire and water to cook this stuff with. And all through eternity, I shot heroin in my veins, and the pile never went down. He said, that's heaven. That's where I'm going. He doesn't even think there's not a drug addict in the streets of New York or anywhere in the country that thinks so. One moment about hell. It's all, I'm going to heaven. One way or another, I'm going to make it. People no longer believe there's any wrath in God. Nowadays, God is all love. He's all sweet, easy going. He's never going to cause anybody to suffer. He'll ne never let anybody be tormented. And that's because this generation has lost its fear of God. Jeremiah the prophet cried out, You have forsaken the Lord your God because the fear of the Lord is not in you now. Isaiah cried, why are your hearts hardened to the fear of God? You sin because your hearts are hard to the fear of God. The psalmist is even more to the point. He said, sin lurks deep in the hearts of the wicked, forever urging them on to evil deeds. They have no fear of God to hold them back. They have no fear of God to hold them back. Psalm 36, 1. They have no fear of God to keep them back from their sinning. Now let me show you what happens when a generation loses its fear of God. The results are terrifying. Our organization sponsors a program called Youth Research Foundation, coast-to-coast -coast program, and we've just completed a one-year research study program from coast-to-coast, -coast, 42 states. This included young people and uh, college students, teenagers, rich and poor, urban rural, every economic social group, and get ready now to be shocked. Now, folks, uh, Gallup poll uses 1,200 people. We use 3,000 in every one of our surveys. And if we multiplied it and did 50,000, the results would be the same, the percentages. Now, listen to this. 84% of the young people are drinking, 84%. 52.7 smoke, 52.2 use drugs, 66 percent, two-thirds of all the young people interviewed said they'd rather live together without a marriage license than get married. They just live together, cohabitate. Now here's the shocker. This blows my mind. Of all the kids in 3,000 that we interviewed, coast to coast, 42 states, of all those who confess they're using drugs, sex, alcohol, drinking, and into the occult, 82% claim to be born-again Christians. Now let me read to you, word for word. Here's a 15-year-old boy from Mississippi. Uses drugs, smokes, drinks, has anything go sex. I quote him, Being born again is the ultimate experience in my life. Christ is my Savior and Lord. 19-year-old girl, from Fort Worth, Texas. Smokes, drinks, uses drugs, anything goes sex. I'm thankful Jesus died for me and saved me from hell. 19-year-old boy from Fort Lauderdale. Smokes, drinks, uses drugs, involved in sex. In fact, he said the most three important things in his life are women, sex, and money. What about Jesus? 
Jesus saved me from hell. Here's a young homosexual from Fort Lauderdale. Drinks, uses drugs, homosexuality. Jesus is my very loving Savior. 16-year-old girl from Mississippi. She's into the occult. She smokes, drinks, and uses drugs. Jesus is neat. I wish he were here right now. I'd like to talk to him. 19-year-old girl from South Dakota. Smokes, drinks, uses drugs. I attend an Assembly of God church. I speak with tongues. Going to heaven is the most important thing in my whole life. Smokes, drinks, uses drugs. Young boy, young man from Hollywood, Florida. Sex, drugs, drinks, smokes. God talks to me every day. I love him dearly. 17-year-old boy from Oklahoma. Smokes, drinks, uses drugs, anything goes sex. I can't wait for Jesus to come. I want to meet him. Folks, what's happening in America? After a so-called 10-year outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon all flesh from the youth revivals and then a charismatic renewal, the Bible says they have no fear of God to hold them back. This generation's lost its fear of God. This nation is going mad because people no longer believe there's a payday. 17-year-old boy said, why not live it up? When you die, you just die. You float off into a world of colors and rest and peace. Our young people today are convinced that the judge has gone soft. There's no more sentencing, no more prisons, no more judgment day. Now, they don't say sin pays. They just say it doesn't cost you anything. It doesn't hurt you. Who's responsible for this madness? Who is it that's robbing this generation of the fear of God? Who is it that's taking them down the road to hell? I accuse here and now the backslidden, unbelieving preachers of the gospel, those who've lost their faith, but who still continue to preach the gospel behind the sacred desk. Now, folks, listen, I'm not, I haven't even started yet. I want... I may never get invited back here, but I'm going to load my guns good right now. Let me, hold it just a minute. I, I am not one of those evangelists who goes around spanking preachers. They get enough from their deacon boards. I, I don't believe in that. And we've got some godly preachers in this place. There are a lot of godly ministers in this town, great men of God. But there are a lot of reprobated wolves in sheep clothing in this town and every town. And these preachers who've lost their faith are sending more kids to hell than all the drug pushers and com pornographers combined. Jeremiah the prophet was heartbroken over the false preachers of his time. He said, My heart within me is broken because of these men. My bones shake. I stagger like a drunken man. I've seen in the prophets of Jerusalem a horrible thing. These men commit adultery. They walk in their own lies. And they strengthen the hands of the evildoers. So sinners will not stop their wickedness. They are unto me as Sodom and Gomorrah. These backslidden priests and prophets of Jerusalem had encouraged people in their sins. Why? Because there was sin in their own heart. You show me a preacher who stands up and winks at sin. He's trying to excuse something in his own life. Jeremiah scathed them with his holy anger. Thus saith the Lord, hearken not to the words of these prophets. They make you proud. They don't speak for the Lord. They speak out of their own hearts. Jeremiah was saying, wicked preachers produce wicked parishioners. Wicked preachers produce wicked people. Yea, they are prophets of the deceit of their own heart. They cause my people to forget my name. They steal their messages from each other. I've not sent these prophets. I've not spoken to them, yet they continue to preach. Jeremiah 23, 21 to 27. Come on, folks. What's behind all this? Not the pushers, not the pornographers, not the massage parlors, not dirty television. They are encouraged by godless preachers. They say unto them that despise me, Don't worry, all is well. And to those who live any way they want to, Be at peace, no evil shall come upon you. Isn't that what people want to hear now? 
Isn't that why they flock to hear preachers of happiness messages and simple positive preaching? Just be at peace. Just think what? There's no hell. Everything's okay. In other words, do what you please. Live it up. Have fun. God is good. Don't worry about hell. You can have happiness. Live as you please. Now, how can you tell whether a man behind the pulpit's a man of God or a man of the devil? What's the test of a false prophet and a true man of God? A true man of God has the fear of the Lord in him, and he turns people away from their sins. Do you believe that? Test him. Is he preaching a gospel designed to turn men's hearts away from sin? Listen to the Bible. If they were mine, saith the Lord, they would try to turn my people away from their evil ways. Jeremiah 23, 22. If they were mine, if they were my preachers, saith the Lord, they would try to turn my people away from their evil ways. There's the test. A true man of God doesn't use lightness in the pulpit. He's not a joker who can laugh when people are dying and going to hell. Jeremiah said of them, they cause my people to err by their lies and by their lightness. Their lightness. They have nothing at all to say to my people. You show me a Bob Hope in the pulpit, and I'll show you a man who's damning people to hell. A preacher who preaches nothing but comedy and happiness has never turned anybody away from their sin. Thank God the Holy Spirit's raising up holy men all over the country. I see this now happening. More and more ministers are weeping between the porch and the altar. More and more men are laying down their golf clubs. More, I'm not against that either. But folks, when the world is dying and going to hell, we have got to have men who come in Sunday morning, having been half the night if necessary on their knees, and come into the pulpit Sunday morning and say, Thus saith the Lord, and the whole audience knows it. You can hardly find a church anymore. Oh, thank God there are some. You can hardly find a church anymore where you can sense the power of conviction, where men are convicted of their sin rather than lulled to sleep in their iniquity. But even in evangelical circles now, too many ministers are growing cold. They're compromising and they're actually encouraging people in their sin. I wrote a book, for example, called Sipping Saints. I struck out at people who think they can talk in tongues and drink scotch and speak in pickled tongues. I don't believe in that. Now, I have a charismatic experience. Now, I don't like the word charismatic. It sounds almost like asthmatic or something, like a disease. But I, I have this experience, and it's, it's a beautiful devotional experience with me. But I want to tell you something, folks. If you're going to boast that you have given your tongue to be baptized the Holy Ghost, you better not be soaking it and smoking it. I, 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 wrote, a, I wrote a book called Sipping Saints. You know who wrote me the most criticizing letters? One, ten pages of criticism? Preachers! I got more bad press, more bad letters from preachers than all the prisoners combined. Brother Dave is a legalistic, uh, fundamentalist do-gooder. Stick to drugs. Well, what do you think that is? That's not a liquid pot anyhow. Who's leading the parade now in America to accept homosexuals? Who is it? Who is it that suggests homosexuals should be proud of what they are? Who is it that says, let's ordain them? Preachers. Ministers. Who is it that's flying now to the Arab lands and hugging Yasser Arafat, the killer of Jews? Who is it? Preachers. My brother, sister, these are wolves in sheep's clothing. They don't know their Bible.
I believe there's going to be a reserve section in hell for the faithless, evil-minded ministers who have helped damn this generation. Don't tell me how hot hell's going to be for rapists and homosexuals and alcoholics and drug addicts. It's going to be far more hot for those who have led people astray. You think of Hitler killing all those Jews, but then you think of a minister standing in the pulpit and can never condemning people to their sins, standing up there, lulling people to sleep, playing the flute while they're floating their way to hell. There's a reserve section. Better a millstone were hung around his neck and cast into hell than that he should offend one of these little ones. Now, I hear a lot of you parents out there saying, Amen, Brother Dave, give it to those preachers. Well, I got something for you. <laughs> parents are just as guilty as backslidden preachers for sending this generation to hell. Have you ever heard parents say, our kids went wrong when they took the prayers out of the schools. Our schools are too soft. They don't discipline our kids. They get away with murder now. They have no respect. The teachers are at fault. My kid went bad, but I've got three other good kids who just had a rotten apple in the barrel, that's all. This one was a bad, basically bad kid. He was led away by his evil friends. His friends did it. The school did it. Listen to what the Bible says. Prepare slaughter for the children because of the iniquity of their fathers. Why this slaughter? Because of the iniquity of their fathers. Isaiah 14, 21. Why are young people being destroyed by drugs and alcohol and sex? Because of the iniquities of their dads and their mothers. Children of the ungodly are always worse than their parents. Your fathers have forsaken me, Jeremiah said, and have not kept my law, speaking for God, but you, speaking to the children, but you have done worse than your fathers, each of you walking after the imagination of your own heart, and you will not listen to me now. You're doing worse than your fathers. When God gave the Ten Commandments to Moses, he said, Speak to the people these words. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, bringing down the sins of the fathers unto the children all the way to the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. But I'll show mercy to the thousands who love me. But I will bring the sins of the fathers down on their children to the third and the fourth generation. Folks, right now we are facing the godlessness of two generations gone by. We are paying the price. Right now, Jesus taught that the wicked children are simply carrying out the tradition of their fathers, a tradition of wickedness, snakes, sons of vipers, not vipers, sons of vipers. How shall you escape the damnation of hell, you sons of wicked men? You're following in your father's steps. You fill up the measure of their wicked ways. You're Filling up the measure. Know how Jesus pinpoints our problems today. Your kids are finishing what your parents started. Cursing, drinking, cheating, adulterous parents have caused this wave in America of immorality. Now, the preachers and the false prophets encourage the kids in their sin, but dad and mom start them in it. I think I know what torment wicked parents are going to face in hell. They're going to have to have an eternity facing those kids in that same hell, tormenting and hounding them all through eternity. Now, this generation's resisting the Holy Ghost. They're getting hard-hearted because their parents taught them disrespect for the things of God. Stephen cried out, you stiff-necked and hard of heart. You do always resist the Holy Ghost. Because your fathers did, so do you. Your fathers resisted the Holy Ghost, so do you. You fall right in your father's footsteps. In fact, Stephen was killed by a mob of children. A mob of children. Now, they were adults, but they were the children of people who had resisted the Holy One, the Scripture says. And you resist God just like your fathers did. He said that to the crowd that was stoning him. 
You resist God just like your fathers did. You're just like your dad. You're just like your mother. Folks, you think about what's happening to our young people in America today. I shudder. I get a chill down my spine when I think what's going to happen 10 years from now if Jesus tarries. I shudder to think what's going to happen when we pay for 50% of the marriages ending in divorce now. 10 million kids living in broken homes right now. Folks, what, what's going to happen when we have 74% of the adult population drinking now and hanging out at all of these uh, happiness hours now from 4 to 6 o'clock with, with their girlfriends and all the cheating and all the fornicating and all the cursing and all the Christ denying? What happens 10 years down the road now if the children are worse than their parents? If it's this bad now, what's happening 10 years from now? Parents who were prayerless, addicted to television, cheating, scrambling for success, wallowing in materialism, forgetting God, forsaking the house of God, burdened down with depression and fear, drinking and cursing and self-centered. Is that why Jesus said there's going to be a falling away? Now, there's one more enemy that's dragging this generation down the road to hell. One more enemy. At first, when I was praying over this message, I was going to say, wicked companions, evil friends, preachers that are ungodly, parents that are wicked, and friends that are wicked. After all, isn't that what you hear around the country now? Isn't that what you hear from sinners? In fact, for years I've been preaching, stay away from the crowd. Don't let your friends drag you down. I'm not going to preach that tonight. I'm not preaching that anymore at all. I'll never preach that again in my life because the Lord showed me something. The crowd doesn't make anybody bad. Your friends don't mess you up. Your friends don't turn you on to drugs. They don't turn you on to drink. Not at all. You were rebelling against God before you ever moved in with that crowd. They didn't put the desire to sin in you. You got that all on your own. The crowd just brought out of you what was already in you. They just helped you be yourself. That's all. I had a teenager come to me and said, Brother Dean, you don't know. You're from a different generation. You don't know how hard it is to stay away from the crowd nowadays. I said, Honey, you don't know your Bible at all. You don't stay away from the crowd. The Bible said you let your light shine for Jesus and they'll do the job for you. They will separate you from their company. You don't have to fight the crowd. Everybody, all these uh, secret believing young people, scared to take a stand for Christ. You know what I believe? I don't believe in secret beliefs. I believe young people that have enough Jesus in the say, make room of Christians coming down the hall. You yourself must first become an enemy to God before you can become a friend of the world. First thing, an enemy to God then a friend to the world. He that is a friend to the world is an enemy to God. How does it start? An enemy to God makes you a friend of the world. Ungodly friends, all ungodly friends have one thing in common. They have all turned away from the gospel. They've all rejected Jesus. Now that's illustrated clearly in the Bible between the friendship of Herod and Pilate. Now, here were two leaders, two government men, who weren't even talking to each other. They were bitter enemies. But suddenly, they find themselves with one thing in common, the man Jesus. Herod and his soldiers mocked Jesus. They ridiculed him. Then they dress him in a gorgeous royal robe, send him back to Pilate's hall. And listen to this. And that same day, Pilate and Herod were made friends, for before that they were angry with each other. 
What made Pilate and Herod, these two wicked men, friends? They had one thing in common. They were both lined up on the opposite side of Jesus. Their mutual rejection of the claims of Christ made them friends. Pilate needed Herod now, and Herod needed Pilate, because they both knew he was the Son of God. They had heard him teach. They knew that they should fall down and worship him. They knew it, but they rejected him, backed off. Now, Herod knew in his heart he was wrong. Pilate knew it, but he heard that Pilate turned him down. Herod heard that uh, Pilate heard that Herod had turned him down, and they got together and comforted each other in their rejection. What made them friends? Their mutual rejection of Jesus Christ. And the only way you can be in the crowd, the only way is to have rejected all the claims of Jesus before you ever got there. If you've got eyes of lust, you'll run around with an adulterating crowd. Adulterers. You'll run around with kids who lay around in the back of vans, making out and going all the way in sex at drive-in theaters. You don't go out and somebody takes advantage of you. Don't believe that. You have that in your heart, and your friends mirror what's in your own heart. Your friends aren't dragging you down. You're dragging down as many as they are. You're in it just as deep as they are. They didn't make you sin. They didn't drag you down. No more talking to me about how the gang dropped me down. I wasn't going to do it, but they forced me. I did what everybody's doing. Everybody going to party, so I go to party. Everybody's smoking pot, so I smoke pot. No, you drink not because you're trying to be sociable. You drink because you like the taste. You like it just like the rest of the crowd. You're with the party crowd because you're a party person. Did you hear that? Let me run that by slow. You're a party goer because you're a party person, that's all. I can tell what you are by the friends you run with. You tell me that, like these kids, I can drink, I can smoke, I can curse, I can have sex, I can use drugs, and still be a disciple of Jesus Christ? That's not what my Bible says, buddy. It says, no man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he'll hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God in the world at the same time. And my friends, the day is coming soon that I believe the next move of the Holy Ghost is going to be a clean-up campaign in the house of God. And all these Hollywood celebrities that are in a Jesus club one night and a Hollywood or a Las Vegas club the next night are going to be purged. If they're sincere, they're going to fall on their knees, even if it costs them their reputation and their jobs and their money and their houses and their lands. I was taught when you come to Christ, you gave up the world. I wish I didn't scream so loud, but I get the feeling it's so strong. The path ends in hell. Now, no one simply dies. It's appointed unto man once to die, and after this, the judgment. Now, folks, I'm going to share with you tonight my concept of hell. I didn't get it from a book. I want the Holy Spirit to make hell so vivid tonight, nobody in this building will ever forget it. First of all, let me say that hell was not made for people. The Bible said hell was prepared for the devil and his angels, and that's all. God said I, he wasn't willing that any should perish and die and go to hell. Not one person. In fact, you can't get to hell until you claw your way there. You have to fight through the Holy Ghost, the Word of God, preaching like this, and all your praying friends. You have to want hell awful bad to get it. Hell was not made for people. And that's why some of these theologians say, how can you reconcile a hell where people are tormented with the love of God? How can God torment people through an eternity? 
Well, folks, they don't understand that God didn't make hell for people. He made it for the devil and his angels. Now, hell is the furthest point you can reach away from God's presence. So when people tell me that hell may be in the pit of the earth, I have problems with that. Now, I don't know where it is. It could be what I call a furnace planet. If it's a furnace of fire, it could be a furnace planet because already we know that some of the planets are on fire. It's very easy to see the Lord said outer darkness. There's a passage that leads to hell called outer darkness. It's the end of this passage. You know what the devil represents? The furthest point away from God that a soul can reach. Here is God. The furthest you can get from God at the end of that outer darkness is Satan himself. That's hell. Now, God could have easily created a planet called hell and flung it to the outer reaches of the dark universe and reserved it for the hour of the damned. I don't know. But I've often wondered in my study of the Scripture why at the great white throne judgment the angel of the Lord binds the sinner hands and feet just before they're cast into darkness, into outer darkness. The angel of the Lord shall bind them hand and foot and cast them into outer darkness. I said, Lord, why? Why are they bound up? Isn't it enough they're going to hell? Why bound? Now I know it for the same reason that some unscrupulous businessmen went into the heart of Africa and brought blacks into America and put them on the auction block, bound hand and foot and sold as what? Slaves. Slaves. All the devil's slaves are bound by chains, and God even delivered the fallen angels to hell in chains. God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them in chains to darkness to be reserved unto judgment. He delivered the angels in chains. There is no freedom in hell. They are bound because that signifies to God, I am delivering you, your slave. This is your property. This is your slave. I deliver him bound to you. You bound him. Here he is, bound. Every sinner is going to be delivered to hell, delivered as a slave, bound in chains. God's chain. And the devil can't loose those chains. In fact, the devil's going to be bound for a thousand years himself by the angel of God. Here it is very clearly in the Scripture. They are going to be bound hand and foot. I don't have that scripture with me, but there's a scripture in the Bible that says the angel of the Lord will go take Satan and throw him in the pit and bind him hand and foot for a thousand years. Now, hell is described in the Bible like this, a bottomless pit, a lake of fire, a furnace of fire, a place of torment, a place where sinners weep and wail and gnash their teeth. Now, is there really literally a lake of fire like hot lava that spews out of a volcano? Is there really brimstone in hell? Or is the fire of hell something supernatural, a kind of fire that our minds can't even comprehend, something millions of times hotter? First of all, folks, I wish you would get out of your mind Dante's Inferno and the concept of hell as being some place where there's just uh, the fire, the kind of fire we picture coming out of a furnace. Do you know, uh, men in China and India have learned to walk on white hot coals. Uh, fire, there's a law of nature that where there's fire, there's light, and there's nothing but darkness in hell. Nothing but darkness. It's dark. If you're thinking of a physical kind of fire, the kind you and I, you and I know as natural fire, you can forget that, folks, because there's a fire far, million times, millions of times hotter than that. I want to talk to you about a fire in the bosom of man. Let me read it to you. Can a man take fire in his own bosom without getting burnt? Proverbs 6, 27. Psalms 39, 3. My heart was hot within me while I was musing. The fire in me burned. I lie even among them that are set on fire. Psalms 57, 4. Proverbs 16, 27. An ungodly man diggeth up evil, and in his lip there's a burning fire. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The fire is in the heart. It's in the mind. It's in the conscience. Let me read it to you further. Jealousy is cruel as the grave. The coals thereof are coals of fire. 
which hath a most white hot flame. What is it? Out of the heart, the spirit of jealousy, the coals are coals of fire, which give out a white hot flame. A white hot flame where? Not down there, not up there, in here. For wickedness burneth as a raging fire. Wickedness burns as a raging fire. The breath of the Lord is like a stream of brimstone. Isaiah 30, 33. The breath of the Lord is like a stream of brimstone. That doesn't mean that there's actual ash falling. No, he's trying to show something more powerful than that. It's like the hot lava of God's breath. I tell you that I believe that hell is ignited here on earth. Every sinner ignites the spark of hell before he ever gets there. Behold, all ye who kindle a fire that surround yourself with sparks, walk in the light of your fire and in the sparks that you've ignited, but you shall lay down in sorrow. When you lay down in wickedness, the fire is a spark that you ignited by your own wickedness. God looked down on the wicked and he said, These wicked are smoke in my nostrils. They are as a fire that burneth all the day long. God looks down right now and he sees the fires of hell burning. He sees it burning in the hearts and minds of men everywhere right now in this auditorium. Jesus said, the fire is in the tongue even. The tongue, James said this, the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. It defileth the whole body and setteth on fire the course of nature. And it is set on fire of hell. Did you hear that? James said, the fire of hell is in your heart and comes out your tongue. What you speak, your confession, that you've denied the Son of God, your wickedness. God's not sending you to hell. You're sending yourself to hell. You're walking in it right now. He that believeth it not is already damned. Jesus warned that hell is a place where the worm never dies and the fire never goes out or unquenchable. Now, what does that mean? What is the worm that never dies? Folks, the worm is the memory. It's the conscience. The torment of hell is the constant replay of every lost opportunity. Even the devil and the beast and the false prophet are going to be tormented by this worm. And the devil was cast in the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are. And they shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Even the devil's going to be tormented. The lake of fire. Folks, you ever wondered what the Bible means? A lake of fire? Abraham was promised a seed like the sands of the sea. The sea. Jude said the wicked are raging waves of the sea or the lake, foaming out their own shame, wandering stars. To whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. You know what that is? That's a sea of damned humanity. That's a sea. That's a lake of lost people. That's a lake that's burning. There's a fire inside of each one of them. It's a lake of fire. The seed of Abraham was as the sea. The prophet here, Jude, says they're raging waves of the sea. You see, that's hell, these raging waves. This lake of raging people with the fire burning in their bosom. What did Abraham say to the rich man who called out of hell to him? Abraham said to him, son, remember that you in your lifetime received good things and Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted and now you are tormented. All right. What was the torment Abraham is describing? Remember, remember all that you had. Remember your lost opportunities. Remember you had plenty of chances and Lazarus didn't. What was the torment Abraham is describing? Your remembrance. I call it instant replay. Now, folks, I want to get heart to heart with you now. I hear people say, well, I believe that, David. All the hell you get's the hell on earth right here. I'm in hell. Have you ever heard anybody say, I'm in hell? No, you haven't been to hell until you stand.
before the great white throne of Christ. Jesus is the judge, not the Father. The Father judges no man, but has given all the judgment to the Son. Jesus Christ is the judge. You've not been to hell until the book is open. And I know what's in that book. I used to think it'd go like this. Well, you committed adultery on January 15th, April the 7th. You cursed God's name uh, 55 times. Here you cheated your income tax and all the ugly, filthy deeds of the flesh. That's not what's in the book, folks. The book's going to be open and you're going to be judged. It's going to be something like this. January the 7th, you were watching television. You heard an evangelist, Jimmy Robinson, Billy Graham. You turned it down. On this day, you went to church with your wife or family. You turned me down here. This day, you were driving to work, feeling depressed. The Holy Spirit was sent to you, said you need Christ. You rejected it. You rejected your friend's call here, 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 here. And all the opportunities, all the opportunities you've had, those, you see, the only sin that really damns you, the real damning sin is your rejection of the love of Jesus Christ. I can't bring myself to believe that God is just concerned about uh, whether you uh, smoke or drink. Those things are damnable, yes. But the thing that sends you to hell is the fact that Jesus stretched out his arms and loved you and called you and called you. He said, I called you and I called you and I called you. You said, no, here, no, here, no, here. You kept saying no to me. You haven't been to hell till you face that. And before you go to hell bound hand and foot, the Holy Ghost is going to implant those opportunities so strong in your mind. That's when the fire begins. Never dies. That's the worm that doesn't die. That worm is going to turn. You haven't been to hell until you're bound hand and foot and face that gapping hole called the abyss called outer darkness. You haven't been to hell till you drift further and further and further away from the presence of God. Until finally face to face with the devil, the Antichrist on one side, the beast on the other. And he clays, lays claim to your soul. Now, folks, let me tell you what I believe it's going to be like. I, I don't believe, first of all, that God gets any pleasure out of the death of the wicked. The Bible said he gets no pleasure out of the death of the wicked. Some people think that God's going to stand on the, sit on the throne all through eternity getting glee. And getting a thrill out of people uh, tormented through hell. Oh, no, no, no. People are going to be tormented because of the memory of the love of God. The love of Jesus Christ and all the lost opportunities. It's going to, it saddens the heart of God. It grieves Him. God's not against any sinner. His love reaches out. And I'm preaching hell, but I'm preaching it to you in love. That's just what Jesus wants. But folks, here's what I believe it's like. Here's a husband from Fort Worth, Texas. A husband that's here tonight, no doubt. He's going to walk out on me because he's going to say some other time, I felt nothing. He's hardened his heart. He's heard Billy Graham. He's heard James Robinson. He's heard Rex Humbard. He's heard them all. Man, he's been saturated with the gospel. He's had time after time. His wife's talked to him. His friends have talked to him. He's going to walk out on me tonight. But one of these days, my brother... You're going to stand face to face with the devil. And you're going to be in hell. And I don't look for you to be in some kind of hot lava with a stench of flesh. No, that's not hot enough. I'm going to tell you about a fire that terrifies my soul. I hate to even talk about it. It's so frightening, even to my heart. As many times as I've talked about it. He's in hell. He sees Satan. All the dregs of humanity, all the perversions, all the filth, all the ugliness of the damned. He stands there and said, oh, I'm lost. I'm lost, I'm damned, I'm in hell. And suddenly the worm begins to turn. I called instant replay. He's feeling the agony of being damned. He's feeling the agony. I'm lost. I'm doomed forever. There was a hell after all. And suddenly the worm turns in his conscience. And suddenly the fire begins to burn. And suddenly in his mind the lights go on. And he's back in this auditorium. And he's sitting right in his same seat. And he looks around. And Mr. Wilkinson's right on stage. Everything's in its place. The lights are on. And he breathes a sigh of release. He pinches himself. He said, oh, my, I don't know what happened. Somebody must have slipped something into something. I drank. I've had a nightmare. I must have had one of those out-of-the-body experiences. I dreamed that I stood before Christ, and I was in hell. I saw the face of the devil. 
Oh, thank God. Lord, you don't have to tell me anymore. You don't ever have to call me again. And I'm preaching the same sermon. He can't wait now for me to quit. He said, Mr. Wilkinson, please give that invitation. And he fills the pool. And he gets up and he walks down now and he's running now. He, yes, Jesus, I'm coming. I'm coming. I've had a dream. I've been scared this time. The fear of the Lord's the beginning of wisdom, and I'm coming right now. He comes down. He stands there. He's surrounded by people, the same people who came that night that he rejected. They're all there. He said, oh, I must have dreamed it. I'm still with the crowd of believers. I've made my decision. Jesus, here I am. He's about to feel the flood of peace come into his heart. He's about to feel the, the warmth of the Holy Spirit. And suddenly the picture goes black. It's gone. He wakes up and he says, it wasn't a dream. It wasn't a nightmare. I'm in hell. Suddenly the worm turns. And all around him, people are going through it, screaming, gnashing their teeth. This waging waves, this lake of fire that's burning in the hearts of men. They're all remembering. They're cursing God. Don't allow it anymore. I've had enough cursing his face. And suddenly the lights go on again. And here he is in his living room now. His wife is there bringing in a cup of coffee. And the little boy is playing with his truck. And Billy Graham's on one of his specials. And he says, honey, come here quick. I think I'm losing my mind. I keep floating in and out of the body. I thought I was in hell. I saw the devil. I felt the lostness. I felt the damning of my soul. Honey, pinch me. Tell me I'm alive. She says, settle down, honey. Everything's all right. See, the fire is burning. This is torment. This is torment. Because now he's back in the flesh. And he said, honey, please... Let's get on our knees right here and now. We've heard him say it so many times. Come on. There is a hell, honey. Come on. Let's pray. And he said, Jesus, come in. I want to be saved. Thank you, Jesus. And it breaks down and it goes black again. So, God, oh, Lord, do I have to put up with that in and out, back and forth, heaven and hell, life and death? I'm lost. My wife is gone. My child is gone. I'm in hell. Can you imagine? Folks, I tremble. You talk to me about some kind of fire out of a furnace. That doesn't scare me at all. What frightens me, my brother, sister, what puts the almighty fear of God in my heart is that I should go through eternity reliving crusades like this, reliving opportunities and calls, reliving every Bible verse I'd ever heard. And all through eternity have the face of some Christian friend appearing here, here, everywhere, saying, Come on, John, Jesus loves you. Come on, John, get saved. Come on, John, here's the scripture. And all through eternity, he says, Get away, don't. So he reaches out to smash that face with his fist. Get out of my sight. That face keeps coming up all through eternity. Every Christian friend, every Bible verse that rings through his ears and his heart. Hell. It shocks me beyond words that we lost our fear of God. I preached the love of Jesus too. I preached it all my life. But folks, we've preached it so much that we've got a pablum God now who has no wrath in him. We have allowed and justified sin and every kind of corruption in our lives. And we picture that when we get to God, he's going to be so loving, he's just going to wipe it all out and let you go scot-free. Now, folks, I don't believe in scaring people to heaven because it doesn't work if you just get scared. And I learned my lesson the hard way. When I, I used to love to preach funerals because I got people scared to start with. And I got more people saved in my funerals than a lot of people did in their crusades. And I, I remember when my wife's grandfather died. He's in his 80s. Grandpa Morgan, great man of God. And he told all of his children, grandchildren, nephews and nieces, 
You'll never get away from the power of my prayers even when I'm dead and gone. My prayers will get you. And I knew he'd said that. And they asked me to preach the funeral, and I just got out of Bible school, boy. And my wife's brothers and family, I, I was only 115 pounds, and they used to call me the screeching deacon and skinny and everything. And I thought, boy, I got them now. Those were days of the open casket, and I'm up on stage, and there's Grandpa's body laying there, and I look out, and there's the family. Boy, and I started preaching hellfire and brimstone. They started sliding down in their suits. And I thought, boy, they're low enough. I'm going to do it now. And I lowered the boom. I said, now, I've given you an invitation, and you better get up and come and kneel at Grandpa's casket or Grandpa's going to get up right now, point a bony finger in your face, say, come on, right now, I told you you wouldn't get away. Pandemonium broke out. Boy, did they come running. They could, they could just see Grandpa getting up saying, come on, David, come on, Ray, come on. I, I mean, they were weeping and wailing, and I stood up there, boy, I'm getting them all saved. The next day, they wouldn't talk to me. They were all mad. Didn't do a thing. I'd scared them. And I said, never again. I'm not trying to scare you. I'm trying to paint what I believe is a vivid picture of hell. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of all wisdom. Now, folks, you and I had better get a hold of God tonight. Some of you people are not living where you should at all. You know it. Some of you have been flirting with sin so long. Some of you have just been so far from the Lord. I'm asking you to open your heart tonight. I'm asking you to say, Jesus, I feel your love. I know you don't want me to be damned. You came to seek me. You came to save me. That's the beautiful thing. Even though there's wrath in God, his love is greater than his wrath. Hallelujah. I'm going to ask you tonight. To be honest, before I close, are you ready? Come on. Is there open, flaunted sin in your life? Are you playing games? Do you keep saying, Lord, you know my heart. One of these days I'm going to come. One of these days I'm coming all the way back. Are you sitting here right now having to admit, David, I've left my first love. I used to have his fire in my soul. Oh, I loved him. The word was real to me. But something's happened to me. I'm drifting away from my first love. God said, I've got something against you because you left your first love. So repent. Remember how it was. Go back and do it all over again. I want tonight to ask you to come back to his arms. Come back to his love tonight. God forbid that you should hear a sermon like this. You should hear a message like this. Then get up and walk out. And say, well, I'll take my chances. I can't imagine anybody doing that. I can't imagine anybody sitting through a meeting like this, hearing the word of God. Now, I gave you a scripture. I didn't preach David Wilkerson. I preached God. I preached Jesus Christ. I preached through the anointing of the Holy Spirit tonight. And I don't think there's any more the Holy Ghost can do tonight. But come down and tug and pull at your heart and say, this message is for you. Flee from the wrath of God. Flee from it. Run from it. Run to the arms of Jesus. You can be protected. He says, come on, I'll take you into my arm as a mother hen gathers the little chicks. Come on, come on, get into the ark of safety. Come on, get under my wing. The storm is coming. The end is coming. All hell is going to be let loose. Come on, get under my wings. It won't touch you. I'm going to keep you. I'm going to protect you. Come on, get in. Folks, you better get in soon because the time is drifting away. Slipping right through our fingers. Our this recording is provided by Times Square Church in New York City. You're welcome to make additional copies for free distribution to friends. All other unauthorized duplication or electronic transmission is a violation of copyright and other applicable laws. This recording cannot be posted on any website. However, written permission to link to the Times Square Church homepage may be requested by emailing Info at timesquarechurch.org. Other recordings are available by calling 1 800 488 
0854, or by writing to Times Square Church Tape Ministry, 1657 Broadway, New York, New York, 10019. Walking in the Spirit. Very simple word from the Lord. Walking in the Spirit. If you will, turn to Galatians, please, the fifth chapter. Fifth chapter of Galatians. I'm going to read three verses that have to do with my message. Galatians 5, verse 16, beginning to read. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Go to verse 18, please. But if you be led of the Spirit, I want to emphasize this word, led of the Spirit, you're not under the law. Verse 25. If we live in the Spirit, let us what? Also walk in the Spirit. Now, Holy Spirit, we honor you this morning. We thank you for bringing Christ to us in such knowledge and wisdom and truth. Holy Spirit, that is what you have been called to do, and we acknowledge and we honor you. We pray now that you give us ears to hear, and I ask you, Lord, to give me a voice to speak. We know, Lord, that you're in this house, and we know that you want to speak to our hearts. We have hungry hearts. We hunger and thirst after truth. And, Lord, we give you, we give you all that we are and all that we have. We ask you, Lord, to make this truth a reality in our lives. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. <clears throat> if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. In plain words, simply this. If the Holy Spirit is in you, let him have control. Obey him. It's that simple. If he lives in you, then take orders from him. Walk in his ways. Jesus sent the Holy Spirit to be a constant, ever-present guide and teacher in our lives. Now, you've heard that, and you know that in theory, but many have believed this concept of walking in the Spirit is such a theological quagmire they can't understand it and you have to be uh, in theology to define it. And I can take you to my library and I can show you books written by theologians, three and four hundred pages thick, and I've waded through some of them and I still couldn't understand what it means to walk in the Spirit. You don't have to be a theologian. You don't have to have a theological background to understand what it means to walk in the Spirit. If I ask you personally, if I could come to you and say, what, what do you believe it is? What does it mean to walk in the Spirit? Could you explain it to me? Could you explain it to anyone who came to you and ask you to explain Galatians, the fifth chapter? Do you have a theory even? Do you have something that you practice, something that you know works in your life? What I'm preaching you this morning is not theology. I didn't get it from a book. I got it through experience and walking in tests and trials, and that's how it comes. Most of us have no trouble believing the Holy Spirit has been brought to us by Christ or given to us by Christ. We have no problem uh, talking about his gifts. We have no problem talking about praying in the Spirit. We have no, talk, we have no problem talking about the gifts and the fruits of the Spirit. We have no problem praying to the Holy Spirit. We have no problem with experiencing manifestations and believing manifestations of the Spirit. But so few of us know the walk of the Spirit. You see, you can be filled with the Spirit. And it's another thing to walk in the Spirit. And that's what I want to deal with this morning, the Lord helping us. We are missing, I think, in the church of Jesus Christ, the one truth, the one great truth that can bring rest to our soul. It's a truth that I believe can take away the distress and bring peace to the heart. And yet we have missed this. We, we have talked so much, especially in charismatic circles, about the power, the anointing of the Holy Spirit, the manifestations of the Holy Spirit. But there's almost little or no understanding of what it means to be under the government of the Holy Spirit. That 
He, he has come to guide us in all truth. He's come to direct our lives. He's come to take full control of everything we say and everything we do. Walk, your walk, for example, my walk has everything to do with me, who I am and what I do and what I say and how I act. It's my lifestyle. And it's not enough for me to be able to speak with tongues and say, that is the Holy Ghost. It's not enough for me to even pray in the Spirit. It's not enough for me to talk to you about the gifts or, or uh, show forth the gifts of the Holy Spirit. I have to have an understanding. I have to know how every day in my life there's such confusion. There are so many decisions to be made. And I can't do it myself. I can't figure things out. Jesus sent the Holy Spirit to take his place. He is in glory, a glorified man. He said, I can't walk with you now. I walk my season in this earth and I fellowship with my servants and my apostles and the, the multitudes. But now I'm going to glory. He said, and I'm going to give you my spirit because you see the Holy Spirit. The Bible said the spirit is the Lord. It's the spirit of Christ himself. I preach the triune Godhead. I believe in a trinity. But the very spirit that is in us now is the very mind of Christ. It is the very essence that is in Christ. The very essence of God himself. We have abiding in us. There are only two ways to walk. You walk either in the flesh... That means deciding your own way, making your own decisions, or walking in the Spirit. And walking in the Spirit means that you make no move, you go nowhere, you, you don't do anything until you consult with the Holy Spirit and you get His mind. That He is in full control, that I have no will of my own. I've surrendered my will to the Holy Spirit. Because He knows the mind of God and He is the mind of Christ. And I surrender my will. I have no more will. I give it to him. Jesus walked in complete submission to his heavenly father. And here it is in his own words. The son of man can do nothing of himself. But what he sees the father do. For what things soever he doeth, so does the son likewise. Jesus said, I can of myself do nothing. As I hear, then I judge, because I seek not my own will, but the will of the Father which has sent me. Jesus said, for I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. And I live by the Father. And in John 4, 17, we hear these words. As he is in the world, so are we. Who do we think we are that we can do what Jesus could not do? Who are we to think that we can make our own decisions, go our own way? And we can do what we think is right. We can do even what we think is good. And we consult with people. We can get on the phone and we can ask, is this good? We can check with our pastors. We check with our family. We check with everyone and last and probably least, sometimes not at all, consulting with the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, I do nothing. I don't say anything. I wait on the Father. I have no will of my own. I'm here to do only the will of my Father. And as He is in the world, so are we. As a believer and a lover of Jesus Christ... I can't conceive that I have that kind of power. I can do what Christ himself chose not to do. Surely he was wisdom. Surely he was knowledge. He was all of these things. But he waited on the Father to see what was the mind of God. Then and then only did he act and move. In the the ninth chapter of Numbers, we, we see a very vivid picture of what it means to be under the government of the Holy Spirit. There was a cloud that appeared when Israel left Egypt. The cloud by day and a warm glow at night, a fire by night. 
And it hung and hovered over the people and began to lead them into the wilderness. And then when the tabernacle was built, that cloud descended from heaven and, and stood and, and hovered over the Holy of Holies, the tabernacle that was built in the wilderness for the Israelites. And that cloud hovered there and they did not move until that cloud moved. By day, it was a cloud, a visible cloud representing, I believe, the Holy Spirit and the very essence and presence of Christ revealed through the Holy Spirit. The scripture says, so it was always the cloud covered it by day and the appearance of fire by night. When the cloud lifted up from the tabernacle, the children of Israel moved on. When the cloud stopped, they stopped. They pitched tent. Then at the commandment of the Lord, they journeyed. And at the commandment or the word of the Lord, they pitched their tents. As long as the cloud abode on the tabernacle, they rested in their tents. And when the cloud rested many days, the children of Israel kept the charge of the Lord and did not move. If the cloud rested for just a few days, the scripture said they stayed in their tents according to the Lord's commandment. Then moved as the cloud moved. If the cloud moved even in the morning, they moved. If it moved at night, they moved. Whether it was two days or a month or a year, they moved not until the cloud moved. Not one move, not one step out of the camp. They waited for the cloud to move. The cloud would lift when it was time to go. If the cloud stayed two days, it would descend over the tabernacle. When it was time to go, the cloud would lift and begin to drift away. And they were told, they were taught, go, follow the cloud. Now, Israel sinned in the wilderness. They committed adultery and fornication, idolatry. But one thing that they were obedient in, they never, ever moved without the cloud, except on one occasion. And I'll tell you that in just a moment. And it led to disaster. At the commandment, the word of the Lord, they rested. And at his word, they moved on. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we have a cloud. That cloud was lifted from Israel because of idolatry and sin in its final days. And that cloud was lifted to glory. But on the day of Pentecost in the city of Jerusalem, that cloud descended over 120 people. And that cloud came down and stood over that upper room, hovered over the upper room. And then it slowly descended more and came into the building. And when that cloud came into the building, it shook. And that cloud, that spirit of the living God, descended further. And that cloud of fire began to break up. It began to split, cloven, tongues of fire. You see, it was a fire by night, and this is the darkest time in Israel. In that dark hour, just before the light is coming, the Spirit of God descends not only above the building, but in the building, and finally on their heads and shoulders. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost. The Bible said, cloven tongues of the fire sat upon each of them. And that word, cloven in Greek, means thoroughly distributed. Thoroughly distributed. That fire began to spread. And not only did that cloud sit upon them, it entered their very bodies, and those bodies became the temple of the Holy Ghost. The Bible said they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak languages as the Spirit gave them utterance. And now they are filled with the Holy Ghost. I ask you, are you filled with the Holy Ghost? Do you, would you answer me? Do you believe the Holy Ghost abides in you? He came. We, we, We keep praying, oh, Holy Ghost, come down. Well, He's here. He has come down. But he wants to take full control of these vessels. 
This is his tabernacle. This is his temple. You see, you can be filled with the Holy Spirit. But the Bible said if we live in the Spirit, in other words, if, if the Spirit is in you and, and the Spirit lives in you and you live in the Spirit, now walk in Him. Now I'll ask the Lord to open up this Scripture to me, this, this matter of walking in the Spirit. And I've been praying and seeking God. Lord, I want to understand this simply. I want you to make it simple so the child can understand, because that's the only way I can come with this, because I, I, want to, I want to live it. I want to walk in the Spirit. I've been preaching about the Holy Ghost for years and years. Pentecostal background, my father and grandfather. Lord, make it simple. And the Holy Spirit, in prayer, said, the truth is, David, that and it's, this is that still small voice of the Spirit. I don't hear audible voices, but that still small inner voice. And this is what I heard that is so simple, most of us miss it. And most great truths in the Bible are missed because of their simplicity. We, we so complicate it. We look for so many hidden meanings and, 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 and come at it in so many different theological ways that we miss the simple truth. And I just waited on the Holy Spirit. And finally, three little words came to me. And the Lord said, I'm giving you the golden key to understand this. And if you'll take this to heart, you can live and walk in the Spirit. And and you can share it with others. And when I heard three little words, I said, Lord, that is too simple. So simple, I don't understand it. Three little words to understand walking in the Spirit. Just say yes. And I I said, Lord, I don't understand that. Just say yes. Show me. Scripture, I was led to 2 Corinthians 1.20. For all the promises of God are him, yes and amen, to the glory of God by us. It's not yes or no. It's not maybe. All the promises of God are yes and amen. And it came down to this. And when I began to see it, I clenched my fist and yet, yes! I began to go over over the promises. The great promises that he gave me. And let me go over some of these promises, the Holy Spirit, that Jesus gave us. And see if you can say yes. And see if you can read it. Clench your fist in joy. And against the devil. And say yes, because it's yes and amen. Amen and so be it. In other words, I believe it. In fact, amen means trustworthy and so be it. I can trust what Jesus said. First thing he said, and I want you to listen closely. He said, I have established you. I've anointed you. I've sealed you with the Holy Spirit. I have filled you with the Holy Spirit. Do you say yes? You can't walk in the Spirit until you believe that you're filled with the Holy Spirit. He doesn't flirt or flit in and out of our lives every time we're in trouble, every time we do something wrong. He's still there. I need him more when I do wrong than when I'm going right. Secondly, Jesus promised the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, that he will abide with you forever and he will lead you into all truth. He will take that which can be known of Christ and he will show it to you. He will guide you. He will lead you. And he'll bring you into the truth of Christ. Can you say yes? Yes. You know I never try to work a crowd. I usually say don't say anything. Don't clap. But I'm so excited on these simple words of walking in the Spirit. There has, there has to come a divine yes in 
intractable, positive, definite, no possibility of maybe or no. Yes! I ran around my room, my fist clinched. Yes! Every promise in the book is mine. When I was a, a boy in my dad's church, they had a song they sang almost every week. Every promise in the book is mine. Every chapter, every verse, every line. And the promise of his love divine. Every promise in the book is mine. And the early church in my boyhood time believed that and lived it. And we do it again today. Jesus promised that there would be an inner voice, a guide, a teacher. He would glorify Christ in you. He would show you things to come. He will show you something about where you to go and how you're to go. Can you say yes to being guided by the Holy Spirit? And here's a promise. In all your ways, acknowledge Him. He, who? The Holy Ghost. He will direct your path. He will direct your steps. When I was praying about this, I said, but Lord, what about the safeguards? Because I, 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 I'm about to order a book. It's a theological discourse or lecture about uh, all the dangers of listening to inner voices. You see, the flesh has a voice. The devil has a voice. And the world has a voice. How do I know it's the Holy Ghost? How do I know it's the Holy Spirit? Now, there are many of you listening to me now and many in the ministry who can't accept this walk of having a constant, uninterrupted voice of the Holy Spirit directing your life. Because you have tried to trust that voice or tried to hear the voice of the Lord. And somewhere, sometime you made a mistake or you say it didn't happen. I thought I heard the Holy Ghost, but it was not the Holy Spirit. Now, there are safeguards. God would never allow his people who seek to be led by the Holy Spirit and walk in the Holy Spirit as directed by the word and then let them be deceived. Impossible. Not when you're on your face, not when you're seeking him, not when you're asking for the cleansing and not when you believe that the Holy Ghost mortifies the deeds of the flesh. Only the Holy Spirit. You cannot mortify your sin. There's no other way but faith in the power and the anointing of the Holy Ghost. If you mortify the deeds of the flesh through the Spirit, you shall live, the Scripture says. Now, let me talk about the safeguards. Ephesians 6.16. What about... You see, you see if, you, if you're going to have the safeguards, it requires another divine yes. It has to be an intractable divine yes. Uh, 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 I will believe. If I'm going to walk this kind of walk, I'm going to believe that the Holy Spirit will keep his word. I'll take these other promises. He has promised to protect us. These are protective promises. So that we know the voice. Jesus said, you, the world doesn't know the Holy Spirit, but you know him. You know him. You know him by familiarity, by spending time with him, by trusting in him. But let me give you the safeguards, please. Take the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Take the shield of faith. That you may be able to quench the devil's voice, every word that comes from his mouth, everything he tries to, in, in, to, to inject into the, to the mind. These are fiery darts of Satan. And there is only one protection, and that is to believe what God said. If you will believe me, if you will take this step of faith, and you will consult me, if you will walk in the Spirit, in other words, trust him that when you seek him and when you believe that he abides in you and that he has a voice, that he will speak and he will lead and guide and keep you from evil. He will keep you from disaster. He will keep you from these terrible mistakes that we make in life. He said, 
Will you believe that I have a shield? I am your shield and I will protect you. I will keep it and trust that he knows how to do it. There's no preacher anywhere can explain how he puts up the shield. My part is to believe that he has promised to be a shield to me. And I go to prayer, waiting on the Holy Spirit and praying, Holy Spirit, you shield me from any voice of the enemy. You shield me from the voice of the flesh. There's another scripture. For the flesh lust or fights against the spirit. And we're talking about now discerning the Holy Spirit from the spirit, the voice of the flesh. And here's the promise. The flesh lust or fights against the spirit. And the spirit fights against the flesh. And these are contrary one to another. And now you have the voice of the flesh and you have the Holy Spirit in my heart. There, there, in this body of mine, there are two voices that are clam- the, the, the voice of flesh always clamoring for attention. And always trying to tell me what to do. Always tell me it's right. Always tell me go to get some counselors to agree with my way. And then go to God and pray and God has to bless it. Do it my way and then go to prayer and ask God to just bless what I have. I hear people say, well, God's given us a sound mind. We have an intelligent mind. And, and God helps those who help themselves. And, and I'm just going to use my intelligent spiritual mind. Well, then you're acting on your own will, I believe. Yes, he does. Now, I'm not I'm not saying you go to your closet and say, Holy Spirit, what dress do I wear or what color suit do I put on today? I'm not asking you to go to the Holy Ghost and ask him what cereal you pick for breakfast. I'm asking you for all of these all of these things that have to do with walking. Walking. Those decisions in life that are so important that we never act. You don't have to go into a closet. You can, you can do it sometimes in just a few moments. You stop. You see, the Holy Ghost is never in a hurry. He's never in a rush. He said, be still and know that I'm God. And you just wait for a moment. If you stop, I don't care where it's at and what the issue may be. Holy Spirit, you abide in me. What is your mind? What is your word? He'll never fail. Now, Here's the voice of the flesh, and here's the Holy Spirit in this vessel of mine. Who do you think is going to win this war? The flesh or the Holy Ghost? Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. This is not your war. It's not mine. I go to the Holy Spirit, and I claim this promise. I claim this, that you're at war. It's not my war. You're, you're the one who's contrary to my flesh. I don't know how to distinguish the flesh at all times, but you know what is flesh. Holy Spirit, I believe you to quench the flesh. I believe you to break through every barrier of the flesh. And give me your mind. Never once will God fail. Ephesians 14, 4, 30, verse 30. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you're sealed unto the day of redemption. And that word grieve, sadden. Don't sadden the heart of God by neglecting the ministry of the Holy Spirit for which he's been sent. But with whom was he grieved 40 years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness because of their unbelief? Israel's most grievous act of unbelief is found in the first chapter of Deuteronomy. It was a time that the cloud was about to move across into Canaan and then the cloud would be lifted. And they were told they stand there on the side of the river and the Lord says, now it's time to act. It's time to go on. Go in. I've made you the promises. You go now. Go into the in, into Canaan. This is where the cloud was moving. And they said no, and they rebelled against him. The Bible makes it very, very clear. Moses said, you did not believe God's word. Not one of you shall see the good land. You will die in your despair. 
God was grieved. Now, God never left them. Even though they were not going to obey God at this time, God was faithful. He saw them through the wilderness. God doesn't drop his people for even an unbelief. God still, they, we don't believe, the Bible said he remains faithful. He still loved his people, though they're in belief. But you see, they missed the blessing. They, they missed the life that God had planned for them with rest, divine rest. The Bible in, in Hebrews said they missed the rest that was promised. Because they did not move with God. They didn't go with God. They didn't obey his word. They didn't go with his direction. And then they gird themselves, the Bible said. They said, well, because now they were told God's not going to go with you. you you're choosing your own way. And so they said, the Bible says they girded themselves. They put on their weapons. They had no direction. The cloud didn't go with them. And yet they went up the hill to battle against the enemy. They said, we're going to go in. And they go up the hill. And the Bible, Moses told him, he said, you're going to be chased as bees are chased, as bees chase you. In other words, you're going to hit a bee's nest because you're going your own way, making your own decisions. God's not with that. And the Bible says they were chased as with bees. Now, folks, I look back over my life and the times that I acted without consulting the Holy Spirit. Not just to get permission, but say, Lord, is this your will? Is this what you want? And when I've acted on my own volition, and when I've taken my own will at hand and did what I thought was just right, and thought I was smart enough and intelligent enough to know what was right and wrong. And I've acted that way. I've every time looked back over my life, as many of these issues that I can remember, of all these times I've acted in my past 50 years of ministry, I've always run into that bee's nest. I've always been chased by distress. I've always found it just like sand sieving through my fingers. But when I've obeyed the Holy Spirit, He's always blessed. And He's always been there. Years ago, some over 40 years ago, in a little town in Pennsylvania, the Holy Spirit spoke to me clearly. Go to New York City. And work with gangs and drug addicts. And it was a clear voice. Now, you just don't pick up when you're in a little town of 1,500 people. Up in the hills of Pennsylvania, you just don't get up and go unless you know God sent you. And then you don't go tell your wife you're going to move to New York. When you have a nice little cottage with a picket fence and nobody around to bother you. No neighbors. You see, you have to hear from God, and I heard from the Lord. He said, go to New York and work with drug addicts. And I moved with the cloud. The cloud was moving. I, I moved with that cloud. I said, yes, Lord. And I look back over those years, and now over 500 teen challenge centers around the world, 500 thousands and thousands of drug addicts being saved. I'm not boasting, but in the faithfulness of God. But... You see, I had been on my face for weeks and weeks praying that God would speak because often when God's trying to lead us, he'll stir the nest and we have that divine restlessness and we know God's trying to get our attention. And I look back over my past life. And I came to New York City and. Four or five years later, after coming, obeying the Holy Spirit, the Lord spoke clearly to my heart. Write a book. And we called it The Cross and Switchblade. And that book went all over the world. And it's opened doors so that now, in my latter years, I can go anywhere in the world. And that book God used to open up the doors. Because, you see, the cloud moved and the cloud said, do this, and I did it. I obeyed him. 
Now, folks, there were a lot of times I didn't. And in between all of these blessings I'm talking about, there there were times of, of loving chastening from the Lord because I ran off and did my own thing and it blew up in my face. Folk, I could write a whole book on just that. It'd be bigger than the cross and switchblade. <laughs> Eleven years ago, I was driving down the interstate in Pennsylvania, one of the interstates. And I, I had some tapes that had been in the car for months. And I picked up this tape and I put it in the tape player on the radio in the car. It was Pastor Conlon. And uh, Holy Spirit said, put another one in. In the second tape, I heard a voice. And the Holy Spirit said, pull off the robe. I said, why? He said, there's a telephone number there. Call him and invite him to preach. So I got on the phone. I got Sister Teresa. And I, I don't remember all the details, but here he is. Still, small voice of the Holy Spirit. I believe this. I believe with all my heart. And I have made an irretractable, absolute, positive yes to every promise in the book. And to believe that what Jesus promised me is true. That this Holy Spirit in me will guide me. He will lead me into all truth and show me things to come. He'll show me the road. This life is possible. The last one I want to talk about was five years ago. The Lord said in your last days, and uh, I don't have any premonition of an early death. I can't die an early death. I'm already past the... <laughs> I'm four years to the good beyond the promise of 70. I know I don't look it, but I am 74. <laughs> That was flesh. <laughs> but the Lord said, I want you to share your time with pastors. And I want you to go to the nations. And we've been doing it for the last four years. And the Lord's been faithful. I want you to stand. And this is not flesh. I want you to do something finally. And I'm not, I promise the Lord, not try to whip you up. Are you tired of making such terrible decisions that just mess up? And are you ready now to say, I hear something from the Holy Spirit? If he abides, if he lives in me and I live in the spirit, then I want to walk in the spirit. I want to surrender my will. And I'm saying, Holy Spirit, govern my life. <sighs> govern my life. You and I are under the government of the Holy Spirit. And that's how Jesus intended it. To bring us into the relationship with Christ that the Father so desires for us. Are you willing to give one irretractable? In other words, you can't take it back. You say, Lord, the best I know in my heart, I mean it. I want to say a great, powerful yes. Let me hear it. Yes. Yes, Lord. Father. Thank you for the Holy Ghost. Jesus, thank you for the Holy Spirit. 
Lord, we want to be a church that walks in the Spirit, that we hear from God, that we hear that still small voice saying, yes, follow me. My promises are for you. Let it be. So let it be. Yes and amen. Not nay and yea. Not yes and no. Not maybe. But yes. Every promise is mine. So be it. Glory to God. If the Holy Spirit speaking to you and you have to confess unbelief and fear. If you don't know Christ. If you've never given your heart to Jesus, I invite you to step out of your seat and come and receive him as Lord and Savior. And to you, you can't be saved without the Holy Spirit drawing you. It's the Holy Spirit that comes to draw you to Christ. And I, we've been lifting up the Holy Spirit as we've been directed by the word. We're to honor the Holy Spirit and we're honoring the Holy Spirit. And as we honor him, he does his work. That means he's come to you and, and pricked your conscience or he has quickened your spirit. And he wants you to yield to him. If you've backslidden, if you've, you've grown cold to the Lord, join these that are coming. And if you're here, we have never, ever, none of the pastors ever try to pack these altars or just have people standing, you know, filling it, all the aisles and everything just for show. God forbid. But if you are drawn by the spirit this morning. And you have been living in doubt and fear and unbelief. And you've been going your own way. And you say, Lord, I want to make a stand. And if you feel that of the Holy Spirit come, you follow these that are coming. And in the annex, you just go stand between the screens. And I'll be praying for you in just a moment. And let's believe the Lord that when you walk out of here, you, you walk out of here with a confidence. You walk out here with a confidence. Bring your sins to Christ. Bring your unbelief. Bring your doubt. Bring your fear. We'll pray with you in just a moment. We invite you to step out. And, and take your stand. Holy Spirit, we have shared with this congregation what we believe is your heart for this hour. And we pray now, Holy Spirit, you will come down and make this real to us, make it a reality. And for these that have stepped out, Lord, only you know what the battle is or what the struggle is or what the need is. And I'm asking you, Holy Spirit, to meet that need. I'm asking you, Holy Spirit, now to open their eyes and their hearts. And Holy Spirit, draw them now into the love of Christ. Draw them by your power now, Jesus, to, to bring rest to their weary heart and mind. Only you can do that. I can't. But come now, Holy Spirit. We honor your abiding presence. Thank you for your drawing, Spirit, how you draw us. And you're drawing us to a deeper walk, a closer walk. Do that now, I pray. And I want you to pray this prayer with me now. Lord Jesus, thank you for sending the Holy Spirit. And now, Holy Spirit, I believe that you live in me and my body is your temple and that you're in the temple and that you do speak and I can trust you to make your voice known and to clear the path so that we know that I know that I've taken time to be with you and to listen to you and hear that still small voice that says, this is the way. Walk in it. Now, let me pray for you again. Heavenly Father, I'm asking for those that have backslidden that you bring them back to a knowledge of your love, that you still love them and that you want to make this the first day of a new beginning. And those, O oh Lord, who are struggling with a sin that has controlled their life and they've cried and they've wept and they don't know how to get free, let them understand that that's the work of the Holy Spirit. If they will trust, the Lord will come and he will mortify. That means he will, he will put underfoot, he will conquer Every evil deed of the flesh, we trust in that covenant promise. Now, Lord Jesus, for those now that want to take a step of faith and go out now and say, Gee, Holy Spirit, I hear it. I'm going to walk with you. Just going to walk with you and talk with you. And let you be my personal guide and my strength. In Jesus' name.
Amen. This is the conclusion of the message. 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 This is the conclusion.